Welcome to Origin and Cause's webinar, In the Lab with Origin and Cause, Accelerant Detection Dogs. My name is George Costandi, and I'm the Business Development and Marketing Manager at Origin and Cause, and I'll be your moderator today. We're going to be discussing accelerant detection dogs, how they're trained, and why we use them in fire and explosion investigations. Afterwards, we'll be doing a live Q&A, so please feel free to submit your questions throughout the webinar through the Big Marker software. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible in the time allotted. If we don't get to your question during the webinar, we promise to follow up with you afterwards. All the questions will be addressed anonymously. But if you do want a shout out, just write your name and come with your question or comment. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website, LinkedIn and YouTube channels. So please feel free to share them with your colleagues or even use them in your team. We'll be sending each of you a completion certificate in a follow-up email. So for those who aren't signed in under your name, but are attending as a group, please feel free to email me at webinar at origin and causecom And I'll have a completion certificate made up for you. At the end of the webinar, you'll receive a questionnaire and we really enjoy getting your feedback through these questionnaires. We want to know what you thought of the topic, the speakers, the content, and what you want to see in the next webinar. Joining us today is Sid Murray. Sid has been training certified detection dogs for over 25 years. He's the trainer and handler of Origin and Causes Canine Unit, assisting our fire and explosion experts in investigating incidents that may involve the use of fuels as accelerants. He's completed over a thousand fire worked with fire departments, government agencies, and companies throughout North America, South America, and Europe. On the subject, passive alert detection dog training manual, bomb dog training manual, and it's not a job, it's a lifestyle. With that said, please welcome Sid Murray. Thanks, George. And thanks for joining us today. We are happy to have you here with us. In an investigation where the use of accelerants is suspected, we bring in a canine unit. In order to confirm the use of accelerants, it's incredibly important that we get accurate samples from the scene to send to the lab. The outcome of the entire investigation rests on those test results. If they come back positive, it can lead to a discussion around insurance coverage, fraud, or arson. If they come back negative, it can prematurely conclude the investigation, and the difference between the two can be a matter of inches. That level of precision can be difficult for a human nose to achieve. It's well known that dogs have a better sense of smell than humans. It's actually between 10,000 to 100,000 times better. That can be difficult to grasp because as humans, we don't overly rely on smell. But put in the context of sight, if you could see and recognize something at 500 meters away, the dog would be able to see and recognize the exact same thing 5,000 kilometers away. This allows the dog to detect extremely low volumes of accelerants with far more accuracy and speed than humans or even machines. From ages of one year or older to sniff out and lead fire investigators to traces of unburnt fuel so the samples can be taken from precise locations and sent to the lab for analysis. An accelerant detection dog greatly increases our ability to locate the residual sense of flammable substances. In 20 different accelerants commonly used in arson, including gasoline, diesel fuel, lamp oil, paint thinner, kerosene, and varsol. We've been involved in investigations where competing experts have collected samples based on their own sense of smell and have come back empty-handed. When our dogs go through the scene, they tell us exactly where the excellents are located and where to take a sample. They have become an indispensable tool in all fire claims, basically functioning like a mobile lab. The good news is they are inexpensive, efficient, and fun to work with. A lot of time and effort goes into training, but doesn't make a good detection dog. They have to possess 
specific inbred traits. In the dog world, a lot of people will tell you to look at bloodlines, but I haven't found that to be accurate when it comes to detection dogs. I've worked with a lot of different breeds from German Shepherds, Belgian Malinois, to Doberman Pinschers and Labrador Retrievers. It's not a specific breed that I'm looking for. It's a temperament. They have to be friendly with people. They have to be able to walk on slippery floors and they can't spook. Basically, I'm looking for who no matter what the situation is, will accept it and work through it. It's the most important thing. This is Smoke Senior. He is a Belgian Shepherd with 200 investigations under his collar. He's 10 years old and I started training him to locate accelerants when he was just a year old. His favorite thing is to work. He doesn't take breaks or vacations. All he wants to do is work. And here we have Smoke Jr. She is a Belgian Malinois, two years old, and she's already started doing some fires. I bring her out after Smoke Jr. in the same spot. She hasn't missed one. One thing that I look for at the outset when identifying a potential detection dog is a high toy drive. Meaning that if I throw a toy, he'll run it no matter what. When I get a new dog, I throw a toy in a field. Hold the dog back, make an about turn, take him back to that area and let him off leash. If he doesn't find the toy, or he returns without it, or quits searching, then I know right away that he's not cut out for detection work. While we use dogs to locate accelerants, explosives, and drugs, from the dog's point of view, he's just after his toy. Regardless of the situation or what's going on around them, all they want to do is find their toy which is where the high drive comes into play. What we are really doing is tricking them into finding accelerants using the toy as a motivator. But in order to do that, we have to associate the sense that we want them to detect with the toy they want to find. To start with, you hide the toy with an accelerant. A single drop is enough. Let the dog see you walk into the room with the toy. When you come back out, he'll go in and find the toy where he detects a scent. Repeating this process will eventually teach the dog to associate getting his toy with locating the scent. The next step is to remove the toy and teach him to detect where the scent is. Once he indicates, you reward him with the toy. There are two types of indications, aggressive and passive. With a passive indication, the dog will put his nose where the scent is and sit. The dog who's taught an aggressive indication will scratch and dig where he finds the scent. I teach an aggressive indication to accelerant dogs because at a fire scene, an aggressive dog will dig right through the rubble to find a passive alert dog will just put his nose to it, which makes it more difficult for an investigator to collect an accurate sample for testing. For example, an investigator from Origin and Cause and I attended a fire where all the rubble had been dragged out of the house and piled up in the yard. I took a steel rod and poked holes all over the pile. The dog came out and started digging exactly where the scent was in the rubble. We sent a sample to the lab and it came back positive for gasoline. But before I even begin training an aggressive indication dog, there are a few things I look for. One is a dog who is hard mouth, meaning he makes it hard to get the toy from his mouth. A good aggressive indication dog retrieves for himself. He wants to get his toy and doesn't want to give it up. 
That's something you can't train them to do. The other thing I look for is a dog who is prone to using his feet. I place the toy under my foot and see if the dog automatically uses his feet to dig it out. Some dogs, even though they are ball driven, won't dig with their feet. If you don't have that in the beginning, you have a lot of training to do in order to get that aggressive indication. The purpose of this specific training exercise is twofold. Again, I am teaching the dog to associate the scent of the accelerant with the ball. But now I'm also teaching them to dig stronger with their feet. First, I drop the toy in the block with the scent. This teaches the dog to use his feet. And you can see he's using his feet to try to dig the ball out of the block. Now the last block you go to is the first block he digs at. So I walk back to the first block to ensure he's searching all of them. This is the next step to teach an aggressive alert dog. I've dug a hole underneath the block. I hide the ball underneath the block with the scent and just leave enough of a crack so the dog can smell it. Once the dog indicates and scratches to get the ball out, I pull him back making a competition between him and I to get the ball. The important part is to kick the block over in the middle of his digging. This teaches him to dig longer. Now we do the same exercise, only without hiding the ball under the block. At this point, the dog has learned to associate locating the scent with getting the ball. Once he finds the block with the scent and starts digging, I reward him by giving him the ball. Once training is completed, we do one more last test to make sure the dog is ready for the field. Accelerant in the building. I give the dog his head, meaning I take the leash off and let him find it on his own. An accelerant detection dog's training takes between six to eight weeks, after which they're ready to be tested and independently certified with their handler. Upon successfully passing their independent certification, they can go on to be an accelerant detection dog team. There are several instances where detection dogs are helpful in investigation, where there are multiple sources of ignition, when they try to eliminate sources of ignition, and when precise sampling is required. If an investigator goes into a scene to do a preliminary investigation and smells an accelerant, he'll first check to see if there are any accelerants stored on the property. In some cases, it makes sense to find accelerants present. For example, I attended a fire with Tom Hutton of Origin and Cause at a garage that repaired diesel engines. So naturally you would expect that you'll find diesel fuel in the area. When we went inside, smoke hit on two or three spots right away. We took samples and all three came back gasoline, which shouldn't have been present at the site. Now your investigation has gone from an accidental cause to a potential arson. When an investigator finds multiple sources of ignition at the scene, that's a red flag for arson. We need to either prove or disprove the presence of ignitable liquids in order to help determine if the fire was deliberately set. I remember meeting Mazen Habash at a fire scene. He told me going in that he was sure of four different sources of ignition. Smoke came out with 11, which was overwhelming of arson. I got a call to go up north and check out a cabin. I assumed it was a new fire, but the case was actually 10 years old. As soon as I got into the cabin, smoke hit on what was left of the floorboards. The forensic investigator took samples to send back to the lab, and they all came back positive for gasoline. In one particular instance, Tom McIntyre and I were investigating a fire the house had had been proven to have a Molotov cocktail thrown at the back patio door. The dog went around the house in the 
in the property and dragged me underneath the patio and indicated an accelerant. Tom had me stop because the smell was pretty strong at that point. I continued around the other side of the house onto the porch. Going in the front door, the dog indicated on the front porch at the door sill. Just giving you an idea that someone had tried to murder this fellow. An accelerant detection dog's involvement in an investigation brings incredible value to a file when it comes to cost, time, and efficiency. As experienced investigators and forensic engineers, we can analyze burn patterns, evaluate shapes and sizes of burn areas, deep charring, low burning areas of consumption, and other factors for selecting areas to sample. But if we suspect the use of the dog brings a whole new level of accuracy and efficiency. All right, thank you, Sid. Uh, so we're gonna proceed with uh, some qu taking your questions right now. If you don't mind, just going into the uh, panel of Big Marker, the software that you're in, and submitting your questions on the right hand side of the console. Um, in the meantime, while you guys are putting in your, your questions, uh, I'd like to go through just some details on Origin and Cause and who we are. So Origin and Cause is uh, the largest forensic engineering and fire investigation firm in Canada. We were established over 27 years ago. We started actually our first office in Ancaster where the lab is where we are today. Um, and uh, that was in 1991 and very slowly have grown and steadily grown to 15 locations um, in Ancaster, Ontario, Mississauga, Kingston, Ottawa, Sudbury, London, and Windsor. We also have offices in uh, an office in Halifax and in Sydney in Nova Scotia. We have an office in Winnipeg, in Calgary, Edmonton, Saskatoon, Yorkton, in Victoria, as well as we have an office in Vancouver opening up very soon. We have over 40 forensic experts that are servicing the, uh, our, our clients across the country. Now, when it comes to reporting and getting onto scene, this is something that is very, very important to us is, is the fact that we want, we take pride in the fact that we get on site as quickly as possible um, and make sure that we get reports out to our clients very quickly. That's something that is a, a huge, uh, uh, monitored performance for us internally and we make sure that our staff are once we receive a notice of loss we get on site immediately and we preserve the evidence we preserve the scene make sure that the scene is uh, uh, documented properly and make sure that we are able to conduct a, a reliable investigation and that's why we have actually opened offices across the country you know originally when we only had one or two offices and we are being called to go to far further areas, such as say, for example, Windsor, Ontario, we get into the car and start driving right, right away, but it's still a four hour drive from the closest location. And that's what's inspired this growth, this geographical growth for us, where we ended up opening up shop in Windsor so that when we do get a file, that we are out there within minutes and making sure that the scene is, is organized or is, is uh, secured and that there is no contamination of the scene or the evidence. So we try to get out there right away and we call the adjuster or the client, whether you be a, a lawyer or a risk manager or, or, or an adjuster, we call you guys from the scene and we let you know what had taken place. What did we see? What did we do? Uh, what are the next steps? And make sure that the client is well aware of the status of that claim whether you're an adjuster and you're looking to confirm coverage or and 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 make sure that your your um, contractors get in and start doing their work or you know if coverage is not an issue but you're looking to uh, looking specifically for subrogation you want to make sure that the scene is preserved and all the comp related components are preserved we make sure that we give you uh, a, a quick heads up as to what's going on and we follow up with with an email very quickly and that's just on the scene then we get once we get back to the office, we provide you with a preliminary report 
uh, and send it to you in a PDF uh, via email within 24 hours, just to let you know exactly what has taken place, what are the next steps, if there are any next steps. Um, and a lot of times we'll be asking our clients as to whether they would like a more elaborate report. Now, these days we're noticing a lot of adjusters are asking for various types of reporting. The, the, the most common kind of variation that we're being asked these days is whether we can just not put it in a formal report, but just a quick email, just throw a, cu a couple of lines for me in the email. Um, I don't want to drive up the cost of the investigation. And so, and, and we're very happy to do that, be, being able to render our opinion in a cost-effective way. And our clients are loving that. The fact that we're able to send you an opinion to say, you know, whether there is subroll potential or not, or whether there are further investigative steps that need to be taken. Um, and so that's just something that, that we have been trying to be agile with and making sure that we're responding to our clients' needs with, in that way. And people are loving it. And of course, sometimes, uh, you know, there, there's instances where they don't, they don't want to be sent any uh, an email or, or anything like that. They, they would like to receive it in a report format, which we do, uh, of course, provide. I want to go over our services very quickly uh, together. So first off, we have a fi our fire and explosion investigation group. Um, and within that is the canine unit, as, as we've met today with uh, Sid, and that's actually smoke processing a scene going through the, 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 the scene's evidence. We have a structural engineering group, which takes care of a lot of structural failures. Usually these files relate to, um, you know, like wind claims, uh, the, the weight of snow, uh, for example, as a lot of times we get involved in barns that collapse and trying to figure out as to whether it, w what exactly was the root cause of those collapses, or even when there's a, a, uh, a uh, faulty installation of some something like, you know, recently we've seen a lot of um, really awful renovations that have taken place, if I can be frank. And, and essentially, contractors aren't pulling permits, the right permits. They're not doing the jobs correctly um, in a lot of instances that we're getting involved in. And so there is a lot of um, uh, failures or collapses or even water infiltrations that we get involved in to make sure that we are able to to um, identify the root cause of the, of the claim and be able to assist the insurer in proceeding with the claim or whether uh, denial is required or if there's a pursuing of a third part, a liable third party. All of those things are, are, are things that are addressed with our structural engineering group. In addition to, of course, when a fire takes place and there's structural issues, of course, our structural engineering team gets involved. We also have an electrical engineering team uh, headed by the uh, our president or, uh, of Origin and Cause, Mazen Habash, who's actually in this photo. And uh, they get involved in, in various types of electrical types of instances. Now, it's not just, you know, lightning strikes or, um, or you know, uh, electrical systems failing, causing fires. There's also a, a sub- service in the electrical engineering group, which is an alarm system analysis group. And they focus on looking at alarm system panels. You can see Mazin here in this photo looking at a panel. You can see on this on his screen, there's kind of like a log, which essentially documents any time the alarm system has, rec has received notice of any sort of movement, whether it be the motion sensors or uh, whether it be any other of the sens sensors activated through the, that's connected to the alarm system, whether it be a window opening or a door opening or anything like that. So we know if it's armed or if it wasn't armed during an incident. Um, I know a lot of insurers offer discounts for insureds that uh, claim that they do, they do have an, uh, a monitored alarm system and were asked, was it in fact armed? Was it in fact in, in use? Was it monitored, et cetera? Was there anyone in the house and during a burg burglary or, uh, or, a suspected, or a suspected burglary? Um, and so we get involved in analyzing the data in these alarm systems. In addition to that, we also get involved in looking at CCTV uh, systems. 
So a lot of times we'll receive footage from an adjuster saying, or a lawyer saying, listen, we've got footage. We want you to mine through, you know, two weeks worth of that uh, worth of footage and try to extract the relevant, relevant footage um, that they're looking for. And so we have the softwares in place and the, the ability to extract data from very damaged things, whether it be a panel that was involved in a, in a fire that, 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 has fire damage, or it could be uh, a panel that has been connect that that was connected, but um, was water damaged due to the fact that there was a lot of uh, fire suppression activate uh, activity on the scene. So that's becoming a very very popular uh, tool that adjusters are using these days. We also have a mechanical engineering group that focuses on mechanical failures, whether it be in large uh, you know, 18 wheelers failing or cause or getting involved in fires, or it could be heavy equipment that that fails and and that could result in claims, peripheral claims, not necessarily the actual item maybe uh, may have caused a fire or something like that, but it could also be a, a, a loss of income or or whatever. So um, the electrical, or sorry, the mechanical engineering group gets involved in those types of investigations. And a subservice of the engineering, mechanical engineering group is uh, looking at event data recorders in vehicles. So, you know, a large vehicle such as the one that Michelle Bradley standing in there in this photo has these recorders that are in each of the systems of the vehicle. So inside the engine, there's an engine, uh, monitor that's monitoring the functionality of the engine in the braking system in the in the computer system of the uh, of, of these vehicles the suspension all of those things all um, report into these event data recorders and from which we can extract data and tell you so answer certain questions like you know your insured may have said that they were slamming on the brakes and that they wanted to, they were trying to stop, but the, the vehicle did not respond. We're able to go into the event data recorders and, and verify as to whether they were slamming on the brakes or not. Um, it, it, all the various systems work together and we're able to pull that data and, and assist you in administering your claim. We also pull out, of course, uh, black box data and newly pull information from infotainment systems where people when uh, what we do is we look at whether there's any Bluetooth connected devices to the to the vehicle and see what kind of activity was happening with the phone and the person interacting with it in the in the vehicle. So was there text? Was there any texting taking place? What messages were coming through? Um, you know, corroborating locations of the vehicle because of the GPS tracking uh, uh, equipment in, in the cars and in the phones, etc. So there's a lot of great information that we are able to assist uh, adjusters and lawyers with from extracting the, the infotainment information. Next, we have uh, our materials and metallurgical engineering team, which gets involved predominantly with water claims. Um, that's when you know we work very closely with subrogation teams looking at failed components such as sump pumps or um, braided hoses from behind, you know, toilets and, 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 and sinks and so on. Also, when it comes to, um, uh, water lines that fail behind, uh, refrigerators and dishwashers, all these things, the materials group gets involved. They look at the, ma the, the material that is, that is, um, installed, whether it be a braided hose, looking at the molecular structure of that that braided hose to see was it a mechanic was it a material failure due to um, a manufacturer's defect was it installed incorrectly was you know there's there's an infinite amount of reasons as to why something failed and the materials and metallurgical team get engineering group that gets involved in a lot of spontaneous combustion claims as well as product liability claims and uh, bodily injury claims. So that, that's predominantly what our chemical engineering group gets involved in. Origin and Cause is leading the industry when it comes to forensic litigation experience. We have been involved in over 1,500 legal cases, qualified as expert witnesses in all levels and types of Canadian courts. 
and we've testified as expert witnesses in over 170 litigation proceedings in Canada, the United States, and internationally. I want to encourage you guys to go check out our website. We've got a lot of great resources on our website, including all the other webinars that we've conducted in the past. Similar to this one, we have a couple of them that have been in the lab that have focused on like a fire, fire related um, claims and another one about water claims. So if that's of any interest to you, they're, they're pre-recorded and they're, they're um, posted on the resources section of the, of the website, which you can see on the left panel there in the kind of the new assignment and the other button is ask a question. So the send new assignment button is used all the time by our clients that want to send us a quick notice a lot. And it asks you for a, a few questions, your contact information and the lost details and who we should be contacting. That goes right to my phone as well as the president. And we triage it to make sure that the right expert gets gets a hold of you or gets a hold of your insureds or follows the instructions, the specific instructions that you've given us. So this is a great tool that clients are using more and more to send us new assignments rather than calling or, or whatever, if you're not able to make a call at the time of receiving a claim and, and trying to get us involved. The next button is ask a question. This is a great tool that clients love. Um, you know, sometimes you may not want to get us involved yet. You just have a couple of questions as to, you know, you're going on to a, a you're going to a claim scene, for example, and you want to know what questions you should be asking the insureds or what kind of documentation you should be obtaining or how you should secure certain types of evidence. Just click that button and send, send us a question uh, and we will make sure to get back to you right away and try to assist you with your question. And in the resource section, we provide you guys with also with quick articles that are on technical topics, but specifically focused on assisting you with administering claims. Um, you know, one of the topics was uh, five common myths about uh, consumer product failures and that everyone needs to know. So we talk about how products fail and what questions you should be ask, asking insureds when you're trying to pursue recovery or subrogation. So those are all very practical, short, um, and very easy reads for you guys. If you're, you know, in the morning, you're having a coffee, it's a quick read and it's very valuable and very, very practical. And that's pretty much it. Uh, I know that we've received several uh, questions now, so we'll tune, tune back into the lab. Great. So I've got them uh, coming through here on my phone. So excuse me if I'm looking down every once in a while. So Sid, the first question's come in and it's asking, how much do the dog services cost? So I, that would be more of a question for me, actually. So, um, so Origin and Cause charges $700 for the dog per investigation, plus the cost of the expenses uh, and mileage. So say, for example, you know, Sid has to go out, has to drive several hours to a, a certain location, it would be $700 plus the, the, the mileage and the expense and of course taxes. Next question is, do you have any dogs in Western Canada? And the answer to that is yes. So we have not, uh, we have access to a, uh, a dog and accelerant detection dog in Alberta, which covers the, the, the whole West coast. Um, and so they service that side instead of having Sid travel all the way there. It's just more economical for our clients. Next question is, is smoke senior the original smoke it's a good question um <clears throat> excuse me uh he he's the, actually the fifth uh smoke the first one uh was it's now it's almost 30 years but um he lived to be about four or five years old and he passed on uh, from stomach problems and then after that the average age for the dogs were approximately 12 years old to work I've had some dogs, Malinois, live to be 16 years old and still work. And you might ask me why work them so long. Well, they they really would go stir crazy trying to live in a home with no work at all because their whole demeanor is work. 
uh, wherever you uh, want to work, they're there 100 percent of the time. Cool. So that you said this was what generation of sit are we at now? That five. Oh. We've got the first one was a shepherd. The next one was a shepherd. The next one was a uh, uh, a shepherd. And then now the one now is a Dutch shepherd, and uh, her his his underling smokes junior is a female Malinois. And I'm sure you're familiar with that breed because they're using them in the military and police now as well. Great. Okay. Next question. How many years do they stay in service usually? Like, is there an average? Smoke senior now is uh, 10, 11 years old. He has had no health issues at all. Uh, no hip problems, which is common in four legged beasts. Um, so as long there's no way that you could, you could just, live with the dog even when we bring them in the house because uh, a lot of the dogs spend some time in the house um, they're told to lay down and it, they lay down in a certain spot but the minute you move or you're moving around the house they're up looking for something to do <laughs> they're uh they're work oriented and that's what i pick them for yeah uh, so the next question that came in was where do you keep the dogs they're mostly in the kennel but also in the yard we take them out and play with them and maintenance work is really uh, vital to a working dog. You have to keep records on them working regularly. And um, they're in the house periodically as well. So between the three places, they're quite content and happy. And so is there a lot of training that 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 maintenance work that you're referring to? Is there a lot of training throughout the week? or Yeah, it's uh, at least two ma tr maintenance programs during the week, as well as I do a lot of work uh, when I'm on a fire scene. I'll prepare the dog for um, some maintenance programs that I'll put in place while I'm there. Great. Okay. Next question. How have the personalities of the various smokes differed? Personalities. Um, I tell you, out of all the shepherds I've had, and, and Dutch shepherds and Malinois, uh, the one shepherd smoke three, when you told him to lay down and relax, he was ready and willing to be able to do that. But the minute you move your feet, he was up and knocking you over to, if you're in his way to work. But for the most part, they're all fairly um, work oriented. So as long, there's no way that you could retire these dogs because of the, the way I picked them. My choice of dogs is high drive, high, and, and by drive I mean high, tro high toy, and focused only on finding that toy. And with that toy, I related to an accelerant. So there isn't much variation in personalities, I guess, because you're looking for a certain personality. Yeah, you're right. As, as far as personality is concerned, the format basically for the dog is high drive, um, uh, total focus on what he's looking for all the time. Uh, yeah, they'll they'll play, uh, and my play is with a, a ball. Uh, you can pet them; uh, they're readily petted by anybody, actually. Um, so, personality-wise, they're all basically the same. We want to work. Great. Okay, next question: How long does a scene investigation take? Well, there's uh, depending on the size, anywhere from a thousand square feet or or more. Um, I'll do three sweeps into a fire scene. The first one is basically a walk around. And before I go in there, uh, my big question is uh, to the homeowner and the investigator is, are there any accelerants on the property? And if there are accelerants, I'm aware of it. And what I'll do is I'll do just a walk around sweep and let the dog have his head and check wherever he wants to. And every time there's an accelerant storage area, He'll hit on that as well as any of the accelerants that are in an area of the fire that shouldn't be there. So then the, I'll put them up, uh, rest them, give them some water, take them back in. I'll do a search again. During the search, I'll have be a little bit more uh, directive towards the areas I want checked, uh, mechanically checking this and that and whatever, and then bring the dog back out again and give them a rest. The third time, I always make three sweeps. The third time the dog goes in, he's a little bit more detailed search. 
more in the areas that the fire uh, maybe didn't happen, just to check to make sure there's nothing else uh, in that area, like out, outside the house. And one particular fire w went to, uh, I was just ready to start and there was nothing but walls left up in the basement. Mm -hmm. And I, when I had them sit, because I always have the dogs sit before I start to have them focus. Then I tell him, fine. And he went straight over the wall and he started scratching the outside of the wall above the cement uh, foundation. And then he did it again, three feet down, another time around the back. So we had five indications. Then he went inside and he hit on the same place as inside uh, the uh, burnt walls that he did outside. So we knew positively there was an accelerant in that area that shouldn't have been in that area. Hmm. Okay. Next question I have here is, so well, just to conclude that question, so how long does a typical scene investigation take? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, maybe an hour and a half. That's about it. Once okay. you get accumulate all your information, take your dog in, take your dog out, you're done. So I, I would imagine it would differ based on the size of the scene, right? But yeah. the average is about an hour and a half or so? Yeah, but approximately an hour and a half, okay. even for a 1,000 square foot. Uh, up to 20,000, hour and a half, at the most, maybe two hours. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Next question. How long does a scene investigation take? Uh, sorry. How fast can you get a, get to a scene? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, it's, it's imperative that I get there as soon as I get the call. So depending on how far it is, I'm in the car with the dog and gone to the fire scene. Same day. Okay, great. How do the dogs investigate the exterior of a property in the winter? Are they affected by snow? It's a good question. Yeah, it's a very good question. And you know, you'd be surprised at the answer. Um, after I've done the interior, I usually do a walk around the property just to check to see if there's any containers uh, that are obviously under the snow. And many times the dog has gone around and two feet of snow, two and a half feet of snow, and dug down to a container that's under the snow. That's been quite common. Amazing. That's really impressive. So, so, so I guess the vapor of the accelerant is not uh, dulled by the the cold in the air. It doesn't seem to be. I'm not a chemist, and I can't give you a thorough answer about that. But all I can do is tell you that it is common for him to go along the top of the snow. And I don't mean where he steps, he finds the container. He'll drag me over to 10 feet away with the wind blowing into his face and then start to dig down on, down on brand new cold snow and hit a container under the snow. Wow, that's really cool. Uh, okay, next question. What is the success rate of the dogs hitting on accelerants in a scene and the results obtained from the lab? So if I understand this question right, I think what they're asking is, you know, for the times that, I mean, if a dog were to go out 10 times and indicate 10 different times, um, how many times would the lab verify that in fact there was accelerants present? Well, with my maintenance and the work that I do on the scene, um, I know the dog is hitting on accelerants. The, the big problem is that um, the, the uh, odor may deteriorate quite a bit, um, and you're going to get uh, a 95% success rate on your dog and your dog's indication being the same as the mechanical device used for um, uh, checking on the samples. I've heard that there's been times where the the test comes back negative mm -hmm. and that you guys ask for further testing, right. more elaborated testing, and that they come out positive. Absolutely. That's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Well, so so in that particular case, um, wow, that's, that, that's pretty amazing. Obviously, the dog's sense of smell Um, styrofoam, underland carpet, 
roof uh, shingles, all the uh, products uh, are, are byproducts of, of petroleum, but still the dog only hits on fuel. That's very interesting. Uh, next question. How often do the dogs go on a seam and don't indicate at all? Okay, if I was to use a figure out of 10 pliers, maybe two. Um, maybe um, there's just no accelerants uh, used in the fire. There are other ways to start fires if you're going to start them, but uh, the accelerant, if it's not there, it's not there, and the dog will tell you that. Great. After all, he's there to find out if there are accelerants present or not. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, it's not a failure if he no, doesn't find it. Right. It just simply exactly. indicates that there are no accelerants. That's Makes the investigator's job a lot easier, too. Yeah. Okay, next question. You mentioned that the use of a canine is cost effective. Can you elaborate on this, please? So I, I could I could answer that question. Yeah. So um, essentially, whenever you take a, a, a sample to the lab, each sample costs on average about four hundred dollars. There's only a couple of labs in all of Canada that do these types of te tests, these forensic tests. Um, and the average cost per sample is about 400 bucks a sample. So if you are relying on a uh, fire investigator to identify the precise location of where an accelerant has been poured and to take that sample and take it to the lab, um, they may take more samples and have more samples tested to make sure that if, if, it, if it wasn't this one sample where I keep smelling it, it may be two, you know, two feet away, I'm going to take this sample as well. So the cost of samples increases significantly as opposed to having the canine unit, they go in and they tell you precisely exactly where to, to, um, to sample. So you will have a significantly lower amount of samples that you are, you are paying for ultimately. Now, here's an example of exactly what you're talking about, uh, George. Uh, we went into a, it was a kind of a cottage home and the, the uh, fire uh, investigators had pulled out everything out of the house. There was nothing on the floor. There was a little bit of the walls left, but as far as the fire scene, you didn't know where it started or finished. So they had a big pile of rub rubble from the interior of the house off to the side. And we went in there, we got no indications in the house. But when the dog went out, and uh, before the dog went out, I used a steel rod and poked holes in that pile of rubble. And the dog came in and dug down to exactly where the, sor the, the source of the odor in the rubble was. And that's where John Cool took his sample. And it came back, I believe we took three samples there, three indications, came back positive. Amazing. Uh, all right, next question. The added expense of a canine investigation would need to be justified to my superiors. What would you say are the most compelling reasons why a canine would be needed? So I think we, we addressed that in one way, the fact that um, you will need less samples. So the overall investigation or cost of investigating it from an investigated, from mm -hmm. a forensic standpoint will be lower. So cost, it is very cost effective. It's time effective as well. So um, instead of having relying on a forensic expert to um, get on all fours and 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 that's really what it comes down to. A lot of times they're really smelling the ground and trying to figure out where exactly they're they're seeing the 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 accelerant is is present. That takes a lot more investigative time rather than having smoke go in and 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 indicating precisely. Um, another advantage, of course, or a compelling reason why to get a canine uh, involved is um, its turnaround time. So in, it, overall, it tells you exactly what to, uh, to sample, and it gets the sampling process started immediately, as opposed to doing other tests in the lab prior to sending it to the, the main lab to be, to be tested. Um, the, the, the dogs are, are assist you in being very precise. That's correct. Yeah. Is there any other reasons that you would say is compelling to get a, uh, 
a canine unit involved? Well, there may be an accelerant somewhere where there's no fire at all. Like, you know, example would be, as I said before, uh, checking the outside of the, the exterior of their house. In one particular case, I mean, I don't know where it went after we did it, but we had a, a rooming, rooming home and uh, the dog indicated on the steps and the threshold into the back door. And um, we checked the hallway and the rest of the place hadn't been burnt, but there was a lot of smoke damage. Went to the, the front, down the hall to the kitchen and then he pulled me over to the front door and on that threshold in the front door, there was Excellinger as well. I could smell it when he was digging. So um, there was more involved in that fire than just a fire. Yeah. So I got another question here. It says, is this recommended for vehicle fires or would the gas from the vehicle affect the results? Well, um, I, I, I think on only one occasion I've ever used a dog in a fire and it was in a showroom in a, 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 for vehicles in a car dealership. Uh, where gas had been poured in there on the seat and the, and what we needed to ex was exact uh, uh, samples taken. Uh, but in a, if you're doing it on the street to a, a car that's been burnt, uh, there's so much gas around from the fire, the, the tank. And an example, uh, uh, as well as a, 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 a false indication, which is not a false, where the, the odor comes up the bottom of the floor of the car from a gas tank and through, say, a gas pedal. And the dog indicates there. There's no accelerant there. That's only vapor from the gas tank. So it's really not that much that it's advantageous. Not an tool. No. Okay. Great. Next question. On average, how often do you utilize the canine unit? And on what percentage of cases do they come back with results that indicate arson? So I know that you've received, a, you know, up to 30 investigations a year or so? Well, every year it varies uh, as much as 30. But the dog indicating on an accelerant doesn't doesn't prove arson. It only proves the presence of an accelerant. Yeah. And that's where it's important to get, you know, you've got OCI has really experienced investigators and they can delve down deep and find out more about the whole story. Yeah. All I do is find the accelerant it's not supposed to be there in that particular part of the house. I mean, beds, couches, windows, inside and outside, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of times when arson is in question and we get Sid involved, you can count on one thing, and that is answering the question as to whether this suspected arson had anything – was you – or sorry – was done with accelerant intention right with yeah. intentions of a, an accelerant right? right so a lot of times one of the typical fraud red flags is if there is multiple sources of ignition and that's where a dog will come in and indicate on several locations Sid, you were mentioning one time you you got you were on a scene where there was 22 different hits yeah we had one where the restaurant uh here in ontario and uh, i got a call and i was there that afternoon and the investigator was there and he said, told me the story. And I went in with the dog and I got one indication. Then I got two. I got 22 indications in this restaurant, in their bar, in their uh, kitchen, in their uh, uh, sitting room. Uh, it wasn't any place didn't have gas in it. <laughs> yeah. So that's the highest amount of accelerant indication that, that uh, smoke has had. Yeah. So you can definitely rely on. Um, answering that particular question, but actually correlating it to or verifying that it in fact was an arson, that is an investigative, um, that is sure. something that is determined in an in, in investigation outside of the canine investigation. And all um, of those indications were positive. Yeah, yeah. wow. Uh, one thing that I can tell you that based on all of our files that we investigate, we've noticed at Origin and Cause that about, it comes in about at a 10% uh, eight to ten percent of our files come in to be determined as arsons or, or intentionally set. Right. But that's outside of the canine unit, of course. Next question: As we enter fire scenes with health provisions such as masks, how are the dogs protected from inhaling all the hazardous fumes during their investigation? Well, you know, it was a concern of mine originally as well, but the dog can't work with a mask on his nose. And um, 
so I went to the U U.S. and belonged to an organization down there with a lot of dogs and a lot of experience. And this is uh, 25, 30 years ago. And uh, everywhere I went and talked to them about that particular product problem, if it was a problem, and all of them said that they had had no problems with dogs inhaling. I mean, they didn't go into a live fire anyways. It was a dead fire. There was no uh, no smoke, uh, only uh, water that had uh, been poured on by the fire hoses, and it makes everything uh, lay flat. So there wasn't a lot of smoke damage, for a lot of smoke coming up from that fire to, for the dog to ingest or inhale. Have you ever heard of any um, any studies that have indicated that work dogs that that specifically focus on accelerants um, have unique health issues? No, there hasn't been because there hasn't been. I mean, a dog that goes into a hot fire, there's a good chance that he's going to ingest and inhale and some problems. Um, well, all, all the people that I work with are investigators. They're not going to live fires, and it's and uh, like anything, um, when you put that water on there, it dissipates and holds down any odor. So you're not getting any fumes or anything other than what the dog smells, and he smells a very minute amount. Great. Yeah. Uh, another question: Where is the closest detection dog to New Brunswick? So that would be Sid, right? Yeah. That would be you. The only ones that I know of, and I've been called by police departments in, in the East Coast as well, and they'll throw something at me and I'll tell them whether it's worthwhile or not worthwhile to give them my honest opinion. And not long ago, a department called me and I and asked me and I spoke with, uh, I believe it was Richard, one of our investigators as well. And I had an okay to go to it, but in getting the information and the pictures and all of that they sent to me, I said, really, it wasn't it probably wouldn't work out to your advantage. So well, we passed out on that. It really depends on the, the scene and the, the size of the claim. I'm oh, sure. Yeah. So Particulars. Yeah. Um, give us a shout if you need, if you uh, would like a quote, of course, we'll be able to help you with that. Also, I have another question here. Aside from accelerants, can the dogs be used to detect anything else? So Sid, you train bomb dogs as well right. and, and drug dogs and firearms as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. Next question uh, we have is, there are times after a property has been repaired um, that has been involved in a, a fire claim, and the property owner claims that they still smell smoke. The question is, um, are there any dogs that are trained to detect the scent of smoke? No, you know, there's a lot of questions about uh, what dogs can do. I just got one this morning. Uh, some fellow lives on an island and there's some kind of amoeba that comes up on shore and he wanted a dog that would go around the the, uh, the beach and check for these amoebas and, and indicate uh, and so on. But in reality, we're all based on what really a dog, what, what use a dog can be used for. Um, to check after... Uh, a renovation company has come in there on the smell of smoke. Uh, there are other, there are machines that do that. You don't really need a dog to do it. And I mean, you're going to spend, these dogs cost 6,000 US dollars to buy without training, no training. Then I turn around and train the dog. For me to buy a dog for one job like that would be, would, would not be but worthwhile. But it would, it would certainly be trainable. Oh, right? it's, trainable, it's trainable, definitely. The definitely. only thing, the only disadvantage that I would find to to hire a dog to to sniff out the smell of smoke is the fact that they sm they smell so much, uh, so much more acutely, and so you, so uh, you know, it's very possible that they could smell smoke sure. in anything that was related to oh, a yeah. fire. Yeah. Whether a human could smell it or not, verifying right. that a human could smell it or not. Is a different story altogether. Yeah, yeah. We've run out of time, so I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Sid, for coming thank you out. For having me. And uh, we will be sending you guys a email survey with just a few questions. If you don't mind just responding to those questions, that'd be great. We really rely on your feedback. A value and of use for you guys.